Good afternoon. My name is Edgar Sieverts, and I will moderate the second panel. There will be a slight change in the agenda because uh, Mr. Kosmos Latovsky was supposed to be the first speaker, but I think it would be better to start with uh, Mr. Robert Zeal because he has a written presentation now. So let's start with Mr. Zeal. Did you get the translation? Yeah? Oh, okay. All right. Good. Uh, yes, for those of you speaking English, the, the second part is going to be in Latvian because uh, because most of the panelists are Latvians and uh, and uh, you can get the translation on Channel One, I believe. Robert Zeal is my name. Mr. Robert Zeal doesn't have to be introduced, but uh, in order to be fair, I will tell you quickly about Mr. Robert Zeal. Robert Zeal has been uh, the Minister of Finance, the Minister of Transport of Latvia. He has worked as the uh, deputy, uh, he has worked as the member of the Latvian Parliament. Now he is the member of the European Parliament. He works in the Transport and Tourism <laughs> Committee. He has been reporter on many subjects. He is also active in the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee of the European Parliament. The floor is yours. Thank you. I would, first of all, I would like to thank the uh, speakers of the previous panel. I hope we will be as interesting as they were. Of course, we will touch upon other aspects. My colleague Kosma Zlatovsky, who is also from the European Parliament, um, and I'm very happy that to see him here, despite the fact that uh, some airlines were on strike, and we, of course, had difficulty coming back from Strasbourg. Speaking about the fragmentation of social dumping, uh, social dumping and the fragmentation of the single market, um, I, I believe this is a real challenge for the European Union, and this is my slogan for this speech. Does it mean that we are going to have a fragmented EU market? Are we going to overcome these challenges posed by uh, social, social dumping, and are we going to reach good results in the end? We don't know it yet. If we talk about the cornerstones of the European Union, then we have all heard about the four freedoms of the EU, free movement of goods, services, persons, and capital. And if we think about these things, and I believe uh, most of this audience has given a thought to these issues, um, then we know that uh, the movement, free movement of goods, it's working well. The same goes for the free movement of capital. It also works well, not only in the banking sector, but also in uh, other related sectors like fast credits and so on. However, if we speak about the free movement of uh, persons, in words, everything is, is, is all right. But on the other hand, that there are certain traits that uh, people want to restrict this area. And of course, there are problems also in free movement of services. During the previous uh, discussion, the service directive was mentioned, and uh, this is also of one of the problematic areas. The service directive is based on the principle of, uh, of origin, and uh, you also saw the divisions between member states with relation uh, to this uh, directive. But it doesn't mean that we have to be angry. However, we need to find argumentation why we shouldn't continue working or, or talking about this arguments uh, related to social dumping, because I believe that this will lead to the fragmentation of the single market. What is social dumping? I will be very brief on this, because uh, we saw this clash of definitions during the previous panels. But it is clear that a classical dumping has been taken from um, other areas, like 
production costs or selling the goods uh, below production costs it simply doesn't work because I think it would be the case if it would be the case then uh, people would simply not refuse going to work in other countries the fight against social dumping what is the aim I would also like to quote uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker but maybe a different quote uh, this was said by Jean-Claude Juncker in September this year and he said uh, that the main of these principles should be the same pay for the same work on the same uh, in the same place then what to do with uh, workers from other countries if we follow the th thesis of uh, Mr. Jean-Claude Juncker what do we do with bankers working in uh, Riga or Tallinn bankers coming from uh, Scandinavia does it mean that um, if they re receive the salary that they do receive now salary allowances and so on and so forth and the variable costs that Mr. Benio already mentioned so this worker from Scandinavia this this bank employee from Scandinavia has come to work in Riga and he receives um, a bigger salary in Riga so what would that mean does it mean that the tax administration would have to impose some additional taxes or some uh, some fines or sanctions against those foreign employees and who are working in, on our market so this could be one of the solutions I don't know which would be the right solution my colleague from France uh, Ms. Karima Deli once said that everybody agrees that there is a problem with social damping in the area of transport and now it's the right time to introduce a minimum EU wage. First of all, not in all EU countries there is an official minimum wage. This is one thing, but if we look at this graph, then uh, in Bulgaria this minimum wage would be 215 euros. In Luxembourg it's uh, 1,923 euros, so this is an enormous difference. So no matter where you would put this, uh, the uh, EU minimum average, whether it would be at the level of Poland with uh, 417 or is Estonia 430 euros, you cannot solve this problem because this would not stop the free, mo free movement of uh, labor or the willingness to earn more, or it will not put an end to, to populism and it will not put an end to, to to hearing things like we will protect our market from people who would want to come in and who would be ready to work for less money in september the european parliament voted uh, approved an own initiative report which was also mentioned by mr benio and uh, requiring among other things that the member states set minimum income at the level of at least uh, 60 percent of the average wage so this could uh, restrict the movement of social dumping but if we look at what it means so what the average wages are in these countries so Denmark in Denmark uh, it is better the, the uh, average wage uh, is um, is a bit bigger than in Luxembourg but Bulgaria is still the same so no matter where you draw these 60 percent it doesn't solve the problem either in essence and I think this also serves as a good argument fighting against this uh, trivial solution to the problem where in my opinion, the most important thing is to protect the, um, the working places uh, in the respective member states. But I believe many countries are opposed to this out of competition reasons. And um, I also have some arguments about the openness and close, uh, clo uh, closing down societies. So how far can we go in, uh, in, in different leveling campaigns? It is clear that in Eastern Europe, uh, the leveling will be smaller. And um, how far are we going to, to, to see dumping in, uh, so in uh, production? One of the speakers already said that uh, 
social dumping is kind of transferred to dumping of goods. But nobody talks about it on the political level. In France or Germany, you don't speak about that because, of course, if a French company goes and produces its, um, its goods somewhere in, uh, in, in Latvia or other Eastern European country, then, the, uh, then uh, it is not uh, as loudly spoken about because the impact is not so great on the local labor market. The investment plan of, uh, plan of uh, Mr. Juncker If we take into consideration the more than 100 uh, millions of euros, uh, you see where this money is basically located. It's basically in the old member states. Is, does that surprise you? No, it doesn't. Because, of course, there is a willingness to, um, to earn money. And if you want to earn a lot of money, for instance, for insurers, for um, other companies, you would go to countries where the GDP is greater, where the, uh, you would go to a country with uh, more population. You need to have guarantees that you will be able to profit from, uh, for instance, um, toll roads. And you would most probably not choose a peripheral country or a country with a very scarce population. And that's why maybe you might wonder about the Juncker plan. What about the designers of this plan? Was their aim to concentrate this money in the old member states? The Juncker plan has been prolonged, and in the years to come, you will most probably see that as a result, the gap between Eastern member states and Western member states of the European Union will have grown even more. And uh, this would be like an invitation to the younger generations of uh, Eastern European countries uh, to move to Western Europe. Talking about the real risks of social dumping, I think very often uh, social dumping is like the Trojan horse uh, for competition and, and the real single market, especially if we talk about the services market. I'd like to quote Mr. Juncker again about this uh, equal pay, but I believe that it would be most importantly to make sure that in the single market the same rules are equally attributed to the same services and provisors. I think we we have seen many, many failures here because Latvian um, car repairs would not succeed uh, in uh, in France or, or, or in the United Kingdom because the rules are simply disproportionate. So I believe this is far more important than the first thing that Juncker has mentioned. On the political aspect, In gas context, we know that the, the that in Germany, the purchase price for the same gas that is that we are using in Latvia or in Poland is cheaper by approximately one third, even though uh, Germany is located much further away from this uh, source of the gas. So, can we say that the goods produced in Germany, like chemical products in Germany, um, are dumped because they are sold um, for dumping prices in Latvia or in Poland? So. Should we introduce a tariff for them, for the uh, German uh, chemical goods, because uh, they receive dump a, a dumping price, which is actually not based on the real economics. It is based on uh, agreements with Russia, which have very little to do with um, economics. Darvish, uh, Mr. Darvish uh, mentioned the example about uh, moving uh, production from the European Union to Asia. In this case, nobody talks about social dumping, which it actually is. Capital dumping, we could also introduce uh, this term 
in the, uh, of the free market. For instance, if a Dutch farmer or a Danish farmer wants to buy land in Latvia, and they do, so uh, we know that uh, there is a problem about the price of, of land in Latvia. In the single market, you have to allow uh, farmers from other member states to buy arable land in your territory. The Dutch farmer receives approximately seven times more in um, area payments than in Latvia, and, and taking into consideration um, the fact that uh, this Dutch farmer can access capital more easily than the Latvian farmer, then that would be social dumping as well. So maybe this is a surprise for somebody, but I would like to turn to politicians. So when we go and talk about all these aspects, and when you talk about the social damping and the free movement of, uh, of persons, you shouldn't be afraid to mention these examples because we need to foster the single market and it's every aspect. The same goes for capital market, the free movement of goods. Let's mention the fact that um, put our farmers into a discriminatory uh, situation as opposed to farmers from other Western European countries. About the uh, transport sector, I think uh, Mr. Kosmos Lutovskis will also speak about that. There is a, there I would like to mention uh, a leg legislative act passed by uh, Germany and uh, France. And I would like to mention the, the, the law in France, which uh, came into effect uh, this summer in July. With most probably, it can be related to the elections. And the principle of these two laws has a very negative impact on, on the transport sector. We do not know what the future consequences would be. And this means that um, the minimum hour wage has to be ensured for all road carriers. It will have a very gra grave impact on uh, road carriers and uh, those new restrictions that we will be ex um, that we will be that will be imposed will um, have a bad impact on the um, single market it is not effective to drive without uh, to drive without cargo and it is not effective if you cross the borders uh, without uh, carrying any cargo this is also to the, to the detriment of the environment the requirements of uh, france and, uh, and germany do not uh, give an answer to the question uh, to, to, to the question whether uh, Belgian road carriers uh, where the minimum wage per hour is higher will be punished if they fail to pay uh, French salaries in France. Then there is also a, a ban for drivers to sleep in the cabins of, of their trucks in Belgium and France. But we, we must say that in the places where the, these drivers are allowed to sleep, the places, uh, the, uh, the, the parking lots are not safe for drivers. So there are not only additional costs but also the drivers have to choose which of the norms they will most probably reach in order to survive. And we can say that the, Bel the Belgians and French are most definitely not taking care of uh, drivers from Latvia, Bulgaria, and so on and so forth. Uh, the trade unions are uh, very shocked about the fact that uh, in, in, in the port of Antwerp, Portuguese uh, drivers come and they take away the cargoes, and I already mentioned this example in the beginning of the conference. I think the result for transport sector is very clear. Transport sector, which is mobile by definition, uh, means that there should be that there sh should be no talk of different rules in different states in a single market. Uh, here we talk about very mobile um, 
actors of the market. And I think if we don't try to solve these problems, then uh, very soon we could uh, re arrive at a situation where we uh, try to distinguish pilots by, by nationality. We know that uh, in the Air Baltic company, the pilots are paid by a, a Cypriot company, which is, of course, also the European Union. So the requirement would be that uh, each uh, airline should have like a um, hub regulation or, or a hub place where all the uh, costs could, should be related to one specific country. But why should we care about such, uh, such um, rules if there is a, s a single sky agreement, if there is a single market? I think if we have a free aviation market, then why should uh, the um, social uh, regulations of uh, certain airports be regarded as part of uh, regulation of a specific member state? We also know about tax havens, but I don't think this is the right way to solve these problems. Well, there are two more examples which are quite recent, and the uh, Polish government decided uh, to order um, uh, helicopters uh, from the U.S.-based company, which is located in Poland, and as a result, uh, the France's reaction was uh, quite vigorous, and they said that they would protect their interests. I see that my Polish colleagues tend not to agree with me, but uh, yeah, okay, I will be uh, open for your further comments. But I believe that France's reaction was quite inadequate in this situation, and I believe that Polish government acted correctly because they tried to protect. Uh, um, their jobs. Uh, then about the introduced payment for passenger cars uh, where uh, Jean-Claude Juncker has uh, managed to, to arrive to a compromise with the German minister. Uh, who received the blessing just uh, before the con Congress of the Christian Democrats. Well, so we can draw our own conclusions in this. Well, taking into account what's happening globally uh, with the newly elected uh, president of the U.S. and uh, his uh, stance with uh, the TTIP and his stance with the uh, relationships with the Caribbean countries and Europe, and taking into account other developments in the world, I believe that the openness is uh, uh, challenged and that uh, promotes uh, to close the doors because uh, we see the trend to grab the power and as a result we are losing our competitiveness and welfare uh, in the long term because um, we can see that people are fighting, fiercely fighting back the competition from outside with all possible means. And finally, well, the current definition of the social dumping is used to limit the competition, and all other aspects are subordinated to this. And then if we speak about the road transport, I believe it's very important to understand whether the tr transport workers are really subject to this uh, directive uh, for posted workers, or probably they should be exempt from it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Zila, for a very interesting presentation. I believe that we can move forward according to our agenda, and I would like to introduce Kosma Zwotowski, who is a member of the European Parliament. I will briefly give you his uh, background. Uh, Mr. Zwotowski is Polish journalist and politician. In 2004, he obtained the degree of Master of Business Administration in Chicago. Since 1990, he has worked in Pedagogical University of Bydgoszcz and in Regional Unit of Polish Television in Bydgoszcz. Between 1994 and 1995, he served as a president of Bydgoszcz, 
which is equivalent to the mayor of Bydgoszcz. And then in the parliamentary elections in 1997, uh, he was elected in the lower chamber of the Polish Parliament, same, and uh, he was member of Committee of Foreign Affairs and Committee of Administration and Home Affairs. Between 2002 and 2005, he served as a member of the Bydgoszcz City Council. In, t in the parliamentary elections of 2005, he was elected as a member to Senate of the Republic of Poland, where he was vice chair of Committee of European Union Affairs and a member of the Committee on Human Rights and Rule of Law. In two, the parliamentary elections in 2011, he was again re-elected and he was a member of the Committee of Foreign Affairs and Digitalization. In 2014, he was elected as a member of the European Parliament. He works in the Committee of the Transport and Tourism together with Mr. Ziele, and he is a member of the ECR. And uh, in addition, Mr. Zwotowski is also in the Employment and Social Affairs Committee. Today, Mr. Zwotowski uh, will speak about why social damping cannot be social. Mr. Zwotowski, the floor is yours. Thank you, Robert, uh, for the invitation. It's an honor to be here. Uh, well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as you have heard uh, already, social damping has different aspects. Uh, you can um, see it as an economical matter, but it is also a political matter, so I have some political remarks on it. Um, prior to the accession to the European Union, all countries of our region have received the promise of participation in a unique prior project, construction of the common market without barriers and with equal access for all to the future profits. We had the promise of a chance to join the group of the wealthy and highly developed Western countries. We all knew that this chase after the richest will last many years but we decided to start it because we trusted our partners. Today, after more than 12 years after the accession, when we catch up already considerable economic distance, when it turned out that our products and services are widely present throughout the European Union, when our employees and services, service providers are valued because of their professionalism and reasonable prices across the EU, we hear that there is too much of common market, that we succeed because of social dumping and unfair competition, and that EU needs to end with, with it by changes in the legal framework. This term, social dumping, very popular and widely used now in the European Union, is based, as it usually happens, on a small grain of truth. Abuses in posting of workers, the mailbox companies, or cases of breaking of labor law, are practices that unfortunately take place on the European market. But I have a feeling that this discussion about new rules on posting of workers is not a discussion how to fight against fraud, but how to find excuse to change the rules of the game only beneficial for one side. And this is the west or western uh, side of Europe. Is it really possible to compare and make conclusions when the level of per capita income and level of average wages in Western and Eastern Europe are so extremely different. Dumping in its, in its uh, original sense means production below cost and resignation from profits to acquire market. Does any one of you know a small or medium-sized business that can afford to provide services abroad below cost or to resign from profits even for a short time? I don't think so. 
Therein lies the hypocrisy of allegations at our address. When companies from Western Europe use advantages of capitalism by relocation of production to Poland, to Czech Republic and Hungary, we have our hands tied by the principle of non-discrimination between member states. We have to agree to lower wages for our citizens and we have to accept conditions of cooperation very often unfavorable for us. We accept it because we know the importance of accession commitments and we believe that the same opportunity will be open for us some day. When our companies, particularly service providers, want to use the same mechanism the richest countries in the EU propose to amend the directive on posting of workers in order to close this opportunity. Most of studies and analysis show that posting of workers is not as inexpensive as we can read in manifests and position papers of trade unions and governments from the West. The employer must provide many additional benefits to his employees working abroad, daily allowances, cost of housing, cost of travel and so on. Already in the sector of international road transport wages of Poland drivers, after accounting all of it, its components, are higher than, for example, the level of minimum wage in Germany. Of course, all these costs together are still lower than the cost incurred by Dutch, Belgian or French employer. It is not a result of intentional action, but a fact of the economic disparities that exist in capitalist reality. The same differences are used by companies from all around the world to invest and to build factories in countries and regions where business costs, where business costs are lower. If we resign from capitalism, what we we will have instead socialism. We know that what it means, empty shops and shortage of everything. The principle equal pay for equal work in the same place proposed by the European Commission, while ignoring all the factors influencing the differences in wages between member states, is nothing more than an attempt to limit access to the single market for the whole group of countries from Eastern and Central Europe. If we are not able to block this proposal in the Council, we will become a second class members of the EU, not only politically, but also economically, without any tool to change this situation in the near future. The transport sector is just the first victim of the economic warfare between West and East. Thanks of hard-working drivers, quality of services and brave entrepreneurs, we are the leaders in this sector. German, French or Italian le legislations on minimum wage are harmful not because of the rate of the wage per hour, but because of the enormity of bureaucracy and uh, number of additional oblig obligations. It is the first reason why Polish or a Latvian company will not be profitable providing services in Germany, even if the employer will pay 15 or 20 euros per hour to his employees. It's not about the wage, but about the protectionist barriers for market access. These companies have to disappear from the market because it is Polish or Latvian, pays taxes, pays taxes there and employs Polish or Latvian well-qualified workers who don't have to immigrate permanently searching for a better life. Europe today is going through crisis on many levels. In the economic sphere, the European Commission is trying to resolve it by retreat from the major success of European integration. There is now a discussion about two 
divided union, too many countries, too many differences between them, too many difficulties in decision process. But those differences were obviously even greater when we entered the EU. Why now the European Commission plans to destroy everything what we have achieved? Because we have succeeded. Reversing the integration process of a single market for services is a blow to the weakest economies of the European Union, which, in addition to the countries in our region, include also Spain, Portugal and Greece. I hope that we all together can build a broad enough coalition to block these irrational and harmful changes. I can assure you that Poland will do everything to make the voice of the Central and Eastern Europe better heard in Brussels. We do not only share a common historical experience, but we do have also common interests and the Polish government will defend them constantly in the EU. But we must um, all together see the, the purpose and the purpose is uh, the better developing uh, European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for this, for this uh, speech. Um, is Doma, I could, yeah. All right, let us continue with the agenda so that we also have some time for questions and answers. And now I would like to introduce the next speaker, Anders Alksnes. He's from the Employers' Confederation of Latvia. He's a labor, labor law expert. He represents employers in communication with the Parliament of, the, uh, of, uh, of Latvia, the Cabinet of Ministers, and state administrative institutions in the context of labor law, social dialogue, and other socioeconomic issues. He's a member of the National Tripartite Corporation Sub-Council and Social Security Sub-Council. Very difficult names to pronounce. He is member of the Latvian delegation to the annual sessions of the International Labour Organization in Geneva. Uh, Mr. Alksnes is also the author of several research papers on labour law and social dialogue. And before joining the Employers' Confederation of Latvia, he held several positions in state administration, Riga City Council, and worked in the private sector. <coughs> he holds a degree in law, has undergone further training in uh, the International Training Center of International Labour Organization of the United Nations in Turin. Please, uh, Mr. Alksnes, thank you for this uh, very detailed introduction. Yes, the titles are sometimes uh, of the of titles of the institutions are sometimes complicated. Dear ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, dear members of the European Parliament, when I received an invitation to come to this conference and speak about social dumping, I chose uh, to speak about uh, posting of workers, and not because I'm a lawyer and an expert of labor law, but rather because I believe posting of workers is a very good uh, aspect how to illustrate the European single market, social dumping, and so on. And I will try not to use legal talk and uh, when, when speaking about this aspect. I would like to, to look at it from a, the socio-economic aspect. So what is the posting of workers? What does this term mean? There are two types of posting. Either a Latvian employer sends an employee to a foreign country for a specific period of time, or vice versa, a foreign company sends its empl employees to work in Latvia for a certain period of time. So both incoming and outgoing posting are not the most popular in the um, events in the in, in Latvia. I, I wouldn't say that uh, many foreign workers are posted to Latvia or vice versa, but of course, I have to mention the construction sector. In case of posting, the employee, employee, employee is still a Latvian employee. I'm not going to talk about individual uh, workers who choose to leave Latvia forever and work somewhere else. 
So for posting, the most important sector in this respect in Latvia is uh, construction. Then the next uh, sectors would be uh, care and uh, medical uh, services. Speaking about regulation, in June this year, the labor law of Latvia was amended, introducing um, basically the um, posting of workers directive in, um, into the legislation of Latvia. So this legislation was uh, broadly um, supported by the old member states. Uh, In our labor law, we have uh, we have transposed uh, the uh, current posting of workers directive, but now the old member states believe that there should be a new posting of workers directive, where the uh, biggest emphasis would be put not on uh, minimum work standards, but the emphasis should be uh, put on uh, on average standards. We already saw from the presentation of Mr. Ziele. Even if we talk only about the minimum wage, the differences between uh, the levels of minimum wages between member states are really, really enormous. And now there is the question, uh, I did some thought. All, all um, Latvian Companies cannot become uh, posters of workers. So if they do not um, have some economic activity outside Latvia, then it is not possible for, for such companies to send their workers to, to work abroad. I would like to mention construction companies and, or, for instance, the uh, timber company Latvia's Finiers and other companies. Uh, thus, I could say that uh, posting of workers or being active not only on the Latvian market is a precondition in order to become a, a, a market leader and to develop the company to the highest standards. So if a Latvian company wants and is ready to start some market activities uh, on the German market, then the question is how can this Latvian company be competitive? Because I'd like to argue, if we would introduce the same um, rules for um, Latvian employer and the German employer, I believe that the average German would rather choose a local company because he or she trusts that local company more and everything is clear because at least in Latvia we see the same thing. We are trying to choose Latvian products, Latvian goods, Latvian food and I think it must be the same for Germans. And now the question is so what are the instruments that enables the Latvian employer to have a competitive uh, costs when sending employees to work, for instance, in Germany. One of the previous speakers already said that it is, if, you sp if you post your employees to a foreign country, then you have many additional costs. You have to pay for accommodation, for traveling, and so on and so forth. So um, the costs are far greater. Therefore, we need instruments in order to make our employer competitive in that foreign market by taking into consideration uh, the, the size of our economy. So how can this Latvian employer be competitive in the European market? Because it is logical. He cannot go straight to this foreign country and cover the same costs which are um, uh, in the uh, German market because the, the level of income is much higher. And we must remember that profit is actually the main target of uh, business people. I think we tend to forget about this, especially in the Latvian context. And sometimes, at least me as the representative of uh, employers, think that the only uh, reason for uh, for uh, uh, the only reason to live for an employer is uh, to provide for the existence of uh, the employees. It is not the case. The profit is the main target. 
The single market, yes, the European Union has a single market. However, if we analyze the data, then we realize, we understand that we, sh we cannot um, have uh, the same costs everywhere. And if we speak about uh, the regulation, about the current directive, and uh, if we take into consideration proposals by countries like Germany and France, then we must say that the, the EU countries have been divided into two groups, old members and new members, like Latvia, all the Baltic states, Bulgaria, and so on and so forth. A former uh, Minister of Welfare, Uldis Augul, uh, signed last year the um, official position on the new proposed directive on post posting of workers and he was against the new proposals. So I, I'm not from the uh, state sector, and therefore it is easier for me to say that this is probably an effort of the uh, old member states to gain back their positions, to protect themselves. And they are, as if saying to the new member states, well, stay where you are and don't come too close to us. But I think this is, in con uh, this is contrary to the sing principle of the single market. I think that for uh, representatives of Latvia who work in the European institutions or other international institutions, we have to come with a very strong um, lobby from, uh, from our side, and we have to face those uh, Western European lobbyists. We need to protect Latvia's interests because the differences in the level of uh, life and uh, the cost differences between the member states of the European Union are not going to disappear very soon. For instance, in, in Belgium, the average wage, minimum wage, is, uh, is a bit more than uh, 1,600 uh, 1, euros, but in Latvia, the average wage is, is around 400 euros, so this is not really comparable. In the context of my short presentation, I'd like to say that the most important thing is to understand that the Eastern Europe, that in order for the Eastern European countries, including Latvia, to be competitive in the Western European market, posting has to be um, well um, regulated and it has to be proportionate. Secondly, we need a very strong lobby from our side. And here I mean it in a very positive sense. We have to fight for our interests. And thirdly, we need to understand that in order to develop and to be sustainable, sustainable a Latvian uh, employer or a Latvian company needs to be active also in the European market. Because this would give the possibility for the uh, for the companies to search for markets not only in the neighboring countries but maybe maybe somewhere further away, and we have to be we we, we have to take into consideration that it is in our interest to have those uh, market actors uh, strong and active in our markets and not somewhere else. Thank you. Um. Thank you. Uh, very much. And as a next, I would like to introduce Mr. Valdes Trezic, the president of uh, Road Transport Association. And I would like to thank you very much uh, for agreeing uh, to participate in this uh, um, meeting. Uh, and he had to uh, step in uh, for the representative of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. And uh, Valdis Strezinch will give us the view of road transport uh, workers uh, about the social dumping. Please. Good afternoon. 
and I would like to thank Mr. Zila for organizing this event. And I would like to thank our Polish colleagues because we have a Polish uh, uh, forces deployed here, and it's, uh, it's 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 very nice to have you here because Poland is a leader in the transport logistics sector, and we have very close cooperation with our Polish colleagues and MPD uh, association, and uh, we are coordinating many things, and we are trying to uh, act in a concerted way at the international level, and uh, then it gives more weight to our opinion. Well, speaking about uh, the problem discussed in today's conference, we as road uh, transport carriers, uh, we have faced uh, it uh, very closely and very vividly. And unfortunately, it started already several years ago. If you remember, it was a German law adopted in 2015. Then came the French law. And we feel it on our skin, one might say, that it really causes problems. We believe that this has to do with fighting competition. With, and if we look back into the history of our development as transport service providers after regaining our independence and uh, joining the EU, even before joining the EU, the old member states uh, imposed uh, their conditions on us. For example, there was a so-called system of permits, and then Germany and France uh, told that we were allowed only to enter the territory of their countries with the so-called green permits. It means that only lorries uh, complying with certain uh, environmental requirements were allowed to enter Germany and France. Well, it made us to make major investments in renewing our fleet. And nobody cared how we would uh, get back these investments, whether it would be profitable for us afterwards or not at all. Well, such a position and such attitude causes certain uh, surprise, I might say. And uh, if we speak about uh, these uh, requirements, uh, then I can tell you that, for example, in France today, also in Germany, we have to register our lorries and we have to inform certain authorities that a lorry with certain registration plate will enter their territory on the given date, on the specified date. And even more, France requires that we have to have an established representative in France, either being a legal person or natural person, holding full information about the actual carrier so that on the request of controlling authorities, this representative could provide this information. And, and this information has to be provided in German in Germany, in French in France, it means that it causes additional costs. So, and this information should contain um, the information <clears throat> from the employment contract, then it has to contain uh, the certificate proving that this driver receives the minimum salary, the minimum wage uh, in force in the, uh, the given country, let's say Germany or France. So as you m might imagine, this imposes a lot of additional administrative and bureaucratical burden on us, and it is 
openly against the free market and it causes real obstacles in our daily operations. If previously we had physical borders and uh, customs duties, then after joining the EU as if those disappeared and we were able to operate uh, on a normal basis and to transport uh, freight uh, across the whole Europe. But now this is not the case. Our companies have developed in Latvia and in other Central and Eastern European countries and today more than 3,000 uh, uh, commercial entities have received certain per permits and we have 14,000 lorries uh, holding uh, these permits and uh, transporting goods to Germany, France, but uh, we have information that Italy is going to impose additional uh, requirements similar to what we have in France and in Germany. Similar trends uh, are observed in the Netherlands. Then we know that Norway, which although is only the associated country, is, is intending to do the same. So this proce process is getting very widespread. And now the question comes. Is this posting directive really applicable to the road freight carriers? Because this is a specific sector. Road transport sector is very specific. It's not a classical posting of worker to a given country where he or she stays for a month or up to two years, where this person operates and then we could discuss about the actual posting and application of this directive to this person while uh, the transport operator is in on the move. Today he is in Poland, tomorrow he is in Germany, then in Spain, then he is back, then he goes to Russia. And if the countries will continue to impose their own specific requirements and conditions, then it will lead to an abnormal situation, to an abnormal administrative burden to comply with these rules. And can you imagine what it will mean to calculate the pay, the wage for this person? Let's say to calculate how many hours this person has spent in Germany, then to pay the German minimum wage, and how many hours he has spent in France, and so on. I don't know. How to apply the same logic to air carriers, for example? Is it really possible to calculate how many miles the pilots have crossed over Germany, over France, and so on? And what about the maritime transport? What about these modes of transport? Will operators in other transport sectors um, be treated this equally? And recently I received uh, the information from my Polish colleagues that in December uh, there will be the ministerial meeting in Brussels. And so it means that we'll try to coordinate our positions there. And I believe that we have to find a compromise and to exclude transport workers from this directive because these transport operators are very specific brand, I might say. And so it's, it's very difficult to draw parallels with other sectors. We have also expressed our opinion and our position quite actively uh, in other fora. And uh, by we, I mean 11 countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we have participated in uh, 
actions uh, in several countries, and we have submitted our um, objections to German and French embassies. We have had activities also in Brussels. And uh, we have demonstrated uh, in Brussels as well. We are ready to continue uh, these class actions. If uh, the developments in countries will go the same way as previously, and if the Commission is not ready to listen to our concerns and our voice. Listening to today's discussions, I see that this situation is not unequivocal and there is a lot to do in this sector. And uh, our Ministry of Transport is on our side and uh, maybe our MEPs can be more vocal and maybe today's conference should have to be organized earlier because the process has started already and maybe, maybe we are a bit too late and maybe we should have tried harder to coordinate our activities with other Central and Eastern European countries and sometimes Portuguese and Spanish colleagues join us in the ranks because they have similar problems. To conclude, I'd like to add a dash of humor here. As you mentioned about what Mr. Juncker had said, the same pay in the same place. And why shouldn't the same be applied to our country? Why German uh, transport workers, transport operators, when they come here, maybe we could ask him as well that he has received only 2.5 euros. And he would have to have also a legal representative here. We could request this documentation from a German driver in Latvian to be submitted to the Latvian authorities in our official language. Maybe that would make this process faster. Thank you. Thank you very much for those interesting contributions. Now we have gained more time for the answer. and for the question and answer session. So if we conclude our Q&I session a bit faster, then, then we will have uh, more time for informal discussions. So please, now it is your turn to, to, to put some questions. Please introduce yourselves. First, I would like to give the floor to this gentleman because he didn't have enough time to put his question uh, during the previous pa panel. Thank you. I'm Maris Smilzinch from the trade union. I'm sorry, the microphone is not on. The interpreter cannot hear. I would like to put a question about undeclared employment. Why do you not fight against this problem? Very often uh, employers say, well, I have just f f forgotten to registrate uh, this person, this new employer, employee. But this certainly has an impact on uh, productivity. If we talk about uh, road transport and road carriers, then of course, if they would limit their speed, then uh, they would uh, their productivity would be lower. What uh, will the European Union gain? I think we we must have a 
solidarity also in terms of wages because uh, to the outside we have to speak with one voice we have to be equal but I think we should have the same system with regard to wages and other gains then another interesting thing in Latvia the goods are not cheaper than in Europe but at the same time our workers receive lower wages than in Western Europe do you think that's equal? So where does the, this money go? Where does this difference go? And I think today's seminar is more about uh, the employers so as to pro protect them also in the context of posting workers. Latvia has uh, started to discuss this issue on the European level. And I think this is not correct if uh, the Western Europeans now start to dictate that, uh, that uh, we have to pay less to the Eastern Europeans. I think this is not correct. Of course, you are consolidating. You might think so, but I don't see it as that this way. Thank you. Maybe I will try to, to answer some of the questions about the social and economic effect um, because these are related to the subject of this conference. It, it was mentioned that um, on the average um, less qualified workers uh, often uh, leave Latvia to go and work uh, in Western European countries. This is the case, but I think we have to think about the co cohesion effect because um, gradually when, when this wor worker goes to this foreign country and receives more money, this money sort of comes back to Latvia. But uh, in if we look at the problem that sometimes highly qualified workers would uh, empl employer, employees would go and work in uh, Western European countries because of higher salaries, then the the effect is uh, very negative and it has has a negative impact on the European Union as a whole because that highly qualified worker would definitely lose the skills and uh, and thus the level of competence would go down and and I think this is a big problem then another problem talking about transfers and this cohesion part maybe this is a different subject and we are going to talk about this subject when we approach uh, negotiations of the next um, budget framework but it is related to the fact that the European Union, when talking about uh, the single market and also the transfer questions and the political union, the social union and the economic union, we say that 1% of the GDP, which is a uh, transfer to the EU budget, is actually quite a lot as compared to what you can do with this 1% locally. The United States is a confederation of states, and there the uh, redistribution of a federal budget is uh, is uh, it's much uh, greater, and therefore people live also in Wyoming and not only in Florida. And this is the central issue, which is partly related to today's theme, but it will be very topical in the coming years when we will have political negotiations about the seven years framework. And uh, sometimes I don't like the Latvian position saying that, well, because of Brexit, uh, the budget would be even less than 1% and there is nothing that we can do. I think this is a wrong position because we are talking about very, very little money that allows us to level out the, um, the, the standard of living and the economic situation among the different member states. Uh, with Cosma, I, I, I think we can both say that we are uh, posting uh, MEPs and we are posted MEPs because, of course, um, we live in our respective countries and our situation is a bit different from th those who live closer to Brussels. 
Thank you. Maybe a little comment uh, to the gentleman from the trade union. I understand at the willingness of trade unions and, and your opinion that it would be better for a worker to receive uh, not the minimum wage of the country where he or she has been posted, but at least the average wage. But you have to understand that the only way now, and that's the reality how a Latvian company can be competitive uh, in Western Europe, is that uh, this, com this um this company charges less money for uh, its customers in that country where the uh, workers have been posted. So it would be very difficult. And if you could answer the question how to uh, how to gain more money by uh, in the German market for a Latvian company, more money than the local companies, then you would receive a Nobel Prize in econo eco economics. Thank you. Speaking about productivity, yes, of course, you are right in saying that um, our road carriers and road carriers from uh, Central Europe are very competitive because very often Germans or German or French uh, carriers would rather not go to, to Russia or to Central and Eastern Asia because our know-how is uh, is bigger in this area and therefore we cannot simply calculate uh, the miles we have to look at this issue more in a more complex way speaking about this consolidation of course we need to reach certain targets and we are not opposed to our um, employees we are not their enemies and uh, we d don't want to leave them without salaries but if we compare the income of our drivers to the income um, of others then they are a bit higher than the average and yet we have problems finding drivers and this problem is not only specific to latvia it's also like that in other countries therefore this is a complex issue And uh, and uh, just imagine the prices uh, for uh, for carrying, uh, it, and if you have, you also have to take into consideration possible price increases, and this has this is a very important factor. Thank you, Amrita Gulbe from the transport company Minotrans. Since 1st of January 2015, we have turned to our ministry. We have asked many questions with relation to the this minimum wage issue. We also contacted the commissioner, but we haven't received answers yet. These issues with relation to as to when we have to start applying the posting of workers directive is very unclear. Mr. Zeal already said most probably you will not get the answer before the elections, but in a private business, uh, we are not working like this. We have certain deadlines to meet. We have a budget to take into consideration. I'm the financial director at our company, and I have long-term plans to make, and I really don't know how this political issue will uh, leave an impact on our business. In this fight between uh, the old member states and the new member states, you have lost sight of the fact that there is a big problem in the transport sector. We, uh, there is not enough staff. One third of our staff are nationals of third countries. That is the, the real situation. Therefore, we have to think uh, long term. We should change this vector. We should not fight. We should stop fighting and start thinking about how to make Europe more competitive. I believe this is the most Im important thing that we are expecting from you politically. So you have to, to change this, this vector, 
we should stop concentrating on certain sanctions and repressions, but we should concentrate more on the development, because as Mr. Trezinch already said, we are paying our drivers more than the average wage in Latvia, and many families in Latvia are very happy to see that the drivers have employment, because um, it is economically viable. It is a very important issue. We expect the deadlines to be set uh, to, to be set for for answers. So, Mr. Ziele, can you please fight for us so that the European Commission and the uh, members of Parliament do their homework, their political homework, till the elections? Thank you. Thank you. I will give some explanations about this German law. You already mentioned that this uh, was during the time of the Latvian EU presidency. Uh, in the Parliament, uh, in the European Parliament, we were able to put this question in the limelight and uh, we started actions. But in uh, June in 2015, uh, the European Commission uh, started this procedure with Germany. So we took six uh, months from the entering into force of this um, law. And Violet Bulch, Commissioner Bulch, um, has also started some uh, talking about this. And, and it's not because the European Parliament doesn't want to put uh, some effort or so that the Commission does something. But I'd like to stress that we basically do not have any instruments at disposal uh, that would make the Commission uh, be more active uh, against uh, Germany. And Jean-Claude Juncker has uh, also stated that this European Commission is a political European Commission. I think this is a good. This is the answer why I do not expect that the Commission led by Jean-Claude uh, Juncker will be able to do something against Germany by the time the German elections come. We tested with the non-binding uh, resolutions how many people uh, support the the, um, the resolution of Jean-Claude Juncker, and, and it was a, a very small number, 115. Thank you. Uh, Good afternoon. In Elksne, the Ministry of Welfare, as my colleague said, uh, we are the ones who work with implementation of posting direct uh, in Latvia. We participate in the Council working groups, uh, revising uh, uh, this legislation. And I have to say that the revision of this legislation is extremely complicated, and people confuse many things, like, for example, there are limitations on employees uh, which are uh, prohibited and certain violations uh, should be um, fight against uh, and for example undeclared work is this elephant in the room really and but unfortunately, confusing between different concepts, somehow we have arrived at the situation uh, that uh, it is almost uh, impossible to uh, put to a stop uh, this process. And uh, the Oxford Dictionary uh, this year has chosen as the year or, or uh, the word of the year or at uh, the division of, of, of the year is post-truth. And post-truth is uh, the situation when emotions take upper hand uh, while the common sense lags behind. Thank you. Good afternoon. Transport company uh, Corbett. My question is to uh, Mr. Trezinch. Do you know 
how many uh, Latvian road transport operators have been checked in Germany. Uh, we have heard rumors that the Lithuanians had paid the first uh, fines in France. But do you have any statistics about the actual situation in Germany and France? reply. Well, what concerns Germany, we had most problems in the very beginning when uh, these um, requirements uh, set into force when authorities uh, were performing checks and uh, we know some operators who had paid fines. But if we speak about uh, today's situation, then in Germany there is a kind of period of silence. It doesn't mean that uh, our uh, drivers uh, cannot be checked in the parking lots, but uh, at the moment we don't have any updated information about any uh, major fines being imposed on our drivers. A similar situation is observed in France when we know that warnings have been issued uh, to those operators who do not hold uh, the attestation uh, document as required by French authorities or who do not have the established representative in France. So therefore, I would urge uh, Latvian companies uh, to um, establish your permanent representative in those countries to prepare uh, the required documentation. Well, so beware. Marek Benio, Krakow University of Economics. I would like to make two comments. One on the introduction of minimum wage law in first in Germany and then in France, and its impact on transport, road transport. It's completely different in the in the two countries from um, our members, the members of Association of Labour Mobility uh, uh, Initiative. It looks like um, in Germany, in the Polish case. On February uh, 2015, so two months after one month after introducing minimum wage uh, in Germany, the Polish government went to German government and they concluded a sort of gentleman agreement on not applying fines on Polish operators. Uh, as long as this commission case against Germany is not resolved. What does it mean? Well, and, I, and I guess it's the same with Latvian companies. What does it mean? It means that the German authorities will not chase your truck drivers and will not punish your companies. But it doesn't mean that your truck driver cannot sue your company for uh, not paying the minimum um, remuneration on the territory of Germany. And I, would, I wish I could say the same about France, but I have signals from the Polish operators that in France they started a, a very aggressive um, campaign um, on, uh, of, of the local authorities against all foreign operators. And this campaign is, I, I give you an example. There, there is a truck driver who stopped um, on the white line, so he didn't park his truck correctly on the side of the road, but a little bit mm, with, with one wheel on the white line. So the French policeman asks, could you move your truck one meter to the side of the road? And he says, of course, no problem. And he jumps into the truck, starts the engine, and gets fined for breaking the, uh, the law on uh, time of work of uh, truck drivers. Now, this, this, is, this is a vicious kind of, um, uh, and, but it's not an isolated case. Um, and, and, this, and I forgot the second remark, so thank you very much.
bit on your uh, last remark uh, when you said a person who would design a way to compete uh, not on the basis of cost for Latvian companies would get a Nobel Prize. How does this uh, actually go together with uh, the statistics that show that most posting takes part really between Western countries where this wage factor is not that. Uh, so did they get a Nobel Prize or what other ways? And here is my question and really not to, to make it a, a nasty uh, one, but actually to use your experience perhaps also with the administration, the state administration, what ways uh, or do you see any chance for uh, industrial policies, for, uh, which for many years in the regions, you know, the best industrial policies were considered no industrial policies, but actually uh, given uh, the patterns of um, uh, posting and competition in Europe, do you see any chance or what ways for companies from Latvia, from Poland, to develop different ways of competitiveness and how can perhaps state through industrial policies, help them do it. Uh, in the long run, I would guess this is really a way in which we all have to invest. Thank you very much. Okay, if you don't mind, I will answer in Latvian because this panel is in Latvian. Thank you. Um, I can respond as follows. The competitiveness of Latvian companies, both at the European level and uh, uh, at the international level, but mostly at the European level, is a very important issue for us, and it is also a major challenge for our companies. I could say that this is the challenge of the 21st century for our employers and our companies. And if we look at the Baltics as a single region, uh, then one of the main problems is that we are a very small market. The whole Baltics is a small market, not even speaking about Latvia or Lithuania separately. It means that we have to find this added value in order to survive not only in Latvia, but also to survive in Europe. And from the theory of economics, it is not the best solution when our employers uh, reach um, or, or are competitive based on the price dumping. It's not good in the long run. But then the question comes, how sustainable is European economy as such? Today, European institutions say that they are trying to support us with European structural funds and so on. But it is possible that in 2020, there are no more funds to channel to Latvia, for example. What happens then? I want to say that Latvian companies, Latvian employers would love to pay their employees, being them local or posted, uh, they would love to pay the average European wage to them. And then some say that employers don't want to pay higher wage. But I'm representing socially responsible employers. Uh, and our members, they are paid much above the average wage in Latvia, not even speaking about the minimum. But the question is about the instruments at the disposal of employers. And this is not a problem only of companies. This is the problem of the legal framework, the problem of European leaders like Commissioner, uh, President Juncker, European Parliament President. Um, and so this is a question about the economic policy in 2030. I'm not talking about the Chinese goods um, imported into European Union. And if we speak about the influence of Germany in the European Union, my forecasts are that if Mrs. Merkel will remain in the office 
for the fourth time, then the Germany's influence will become even stronger. I'm not saying that it's bad, but we have to think uh, what are the consequences of this political influence of Germany at European level. For me, as a simple observer, sometimes seems that Europe uh, relies on Mrs. Merkel as being the only one in Europe uh, who is able to stand against Putin and who is able to negotiate with Putin. And here I understand what Mr. Zila said, that uh, the European Parliament uh, can do whatever it wants, but it will not be able to enforce anything on the Commission. And therefore, so this is between Ms. Merkel and Mr. Juncker. Thank you. Good afternoon. Indra Gromula. Uh, from the Road Transport uh, Directorate. And the directorate is where both parties meet employers and employees because we receive complaints from both sides. And our daily work has to do with resolving these problems and to help operators when they are uh, receiving fines in Germany, in France, or other countries. Today we are speaking mostly about the minimum wage, but the, this question in general is much complicated because our duty is to protect our operators at the international level and we have some victories under our belt because uh, we are collecting this information and uh, then submitting it to the European Commission and to French authorities, namely about the resting time, 45 hours per week, and we have uh, achieved uh, that um, no information will be requested about where these 45 hours had been spent if the driver has not been caught uh, resting in the cabin of the lorry. Then we know that this social package is under the public hearing and it will finish in December this year, but if you agree to including the minimum uh, wage and that the uh, transport sector being subject to the posting directive, then we are ready uh, to discuss about more liberalization in the area of cabotage services. And then the question comes for the period of time which has to be spent in the country of origin of the driver. And then we recently met uh, representatives of the Commission from the DG Move about uh, the initiatives they are planning. And one of the questions they are discussing is about the timing that, for example, when this international transport is for more than a certain number of days, then there is again, a new administrative barrier, and so on and so on. And currently, the situation is so complex. As soon as you move one piece of this puzzle, the whole puzzle falls apart. And we are thinking about uh, different possible solutions. We are mm, working on our position. Uh, we are negotiating with the Commission. Currently, the market is uh, being um, distorted because em employ employees, uh, they are willing to be posted to other countries because it has to do with their social contributions, with their wages, and so on. So they are jealous of those who are sent to other countries, who are posted. Then comes a question about the lack of uh, infrastructure of parking lots, for example. And then uh, there are questions about the traffic security, traffic safety. Uh, we know that, for example, lorries uh, leave uh, their um, 
trailers in France and then they go with a cabin to Germany to sleep over that night in Germany because it's cheaper. And then comes a question about the traffic safety. So, of course, we are not expecting a major liberalization in the area of cabotage services, but at least we would expect the situation to be frozen or, or limited as it, as it is now, because now we hear rumors about imposing even more restrictions on cabotage. So now we are speaking about kind of hot potato situation between the West and the East. Egils Baldzens from the uh, Free Trade Union Association of Latvia. I'm not an expert in the area of transport. I used to be. I, I used to work also in a, a trade union for road hauliers, but um, I haven't followed that area closely since then. I think we should have uh, collective bargaining agreements and uh, we should have uh, proper regulation and I think uh, collective uh, agreements would solve a lot of problems including in the area of um, salaries. But I would like to touch upon another question. When uh, the Laval case came up in, in Sweden a few years ago, I was asked a question by the media. And I was asked the question uh, how about, um, about what I thought about the salaries. Should the salary for Latvian workers working in Sweden be the same as in Sweden? Then I said, well, yes, of course, if, this, if these people live and work in Sweden, then they have, must receive the same salaries. But then if we want to be competitive, then uh, we should think about how to be competitive in terms of, uh, of quality and deadlines and, uh, and work costs. We also have to think about profit of the companies because, of course, no company is able to work without profit. And then we need to think how to achieve this all. So, but we would suggest that all the work related to posting workers directive will end up in um, higher salaries for posted workers and higher social standards. And on the other hand, uh, our companies should not lose on competitiveness. And uh, I think here we should take into consideration several aspects. First of all, we need to work on our tax policy. We, we need to look at our salaries because I think these two areas have been neglected for a long time in Latvia because our tax policy and also our salary setting policy should uh, promote competitiveness. And it's not the case right now. If we don't do so, then uh, we will always face problems. And as a result, we will be very slow in our development. And it will be an unsteady development. Thank you. I have a comment. I agree with my colleague uh, Gilles Baldzans from the Free Trade Union Association. I believe uh, here uh, there is uh, the, the, the role of the state is very important. Our costs, uh, labor costs are very high and the taxes are very high at the moment. But, of course, there shouldn't be two situations, namely a situation that the employer um, has to use all the income for salaries and, and the taxes and so on. And on the other side, there should not be this proportionality either. So there has to be harmony between those two sides. Only This is the only way we can reach development. Thank you. Uh, 
labdien, Iveta Suraka. Iveta Suraka from the uh, State Social Security Agency. Uh, we are the institution issuing A1 certificates. And I would like to speak about the problems that we have heard about today. This PDA-1 certificate is issued according to 88321 from 2004, uh, and there are two aspects. Posted worker is one of the aspects, and Article 12 comes in when we talk about that. These, uh, this is applied to posted workers. However, um, Article 13 speaks about workers working in one or several member states, and it's a different issue. So if the worker does not work or is not active in this one country, for instance, in Germany, then it might be posting. However, if the worker is being sent to several countries, so, for instance, he unloads the goods in several countries, then this is not posting anymore. This would be seen as working in one or several member states. And then this, then we would issue the certificate according to Article 13. At the moment, we have received from Germany a letter, a warning letter, about one transport company. They know that we have issued certificate according to Article 13. They know that uh, this uh, carrier has been working in several member states, but they still believe that this is posting. So uh, maybe it is a rhetorical question, but I really don't understand how what arguments can I give to my German companies why this uh, company has received a, a certificate PDA-1 according to Article 13? Thank you. I don't think I can comment much, but it shows why the European Commission has started the case against the German government. So they had a legal grounding to, um, to stop Germany from um, executing this, from uh, from ex executing this new law. Very briefly, good news from you, actually. Of course, we can discuss about this issue, but um, speaking about the general problem, the question is why Germany and France have ignored the requirements of this directive. So I guess there is a certain reason why the European Commission uh, objects and wants to cancel this requirement. A very short comment. So this is basically the problem, because according to international labor law, three sectors have always been outside the other regulations. And this would be transport, namely road carriers, aviation, and, um, and, and marine transport both cargo and passenger. And this is very important. The, all countries have to, to, to agree what this uh, posting workers directive uh, really means and to which um, sectors it can be attributed. Thank you. Now I think we should draw the conclusions. Uh, there is also a lunch waiting for us, or well, maybe not really lunch, but some snacks are waiting for us, and we can discuss further informally. Before I close, I would like uh, to give a few conclusions. Uh, me and my colleague, Mr. Lutovskis, uh, in the European Parliament have experienced a lot of debates like this. Oh. You may have the feeling that uh, the posting of workers directive and also the issues on social dumping are unjust. Very often we are in situations like that, and of course we have to fight. It doesn't mean that we are losing this fight. I would like to give you two examples, less known perhaps. In Latvia, at, at the beginning of the crisis, we, we saved uh, the Parex Bank in 2008 
we had similar pro problems in uh, the central banks from from the uh, from the three from the three um, Scandinavian countries uh, turned for help to the central bank and they basically received money to, in order to save their their banks without touching the taxpayers money we wanted to to act similarly but we received an answer saying that uh, you are in a different weight category so you cannot be saved in this way we could have been very angry and said well okay we are going to to leave the eu and uh, and we don't want to join the eurozone what the latvian government did in, at the end of 2008 and the beginning of 2009 was the the only right choice to join the euro in a small country like latvia is and now the european central bank guarantees such the same kind of support as uh, as we wanted to have uh, before the crisis. We know that uh, Greece has been punished uh, for certain things with relation to the stability and growth back then, but we know at the same time that Italy has never been punished for very similar things. And I wrote a letter to Valdis Dombrovskis and his uh, his response was very uh, diplomatic, but well, Germany uh, abused the, the Growth and Stability Pact. It violated it, so it exported uh, more than imported, and this is a violation for which it had to be fined. And the response was very diplomatic, but the essence is that we cannot fine Germany. We cannot punish Germany. So this is real politique. And what we are talking about today is one of such real politic elements. And well, let's fight for our rights and let's uh, fight for equal treatment. And I believe that uh, we can achieve something in the course of revision of this directive. Of course, it will not be simple. And there is no one simple truth, actually. And I would like to thank all of you who came, Co Kosmas Watovsky, uh, Marek Bonjo, and uh, Magdalena Berniaczka, and Mr. Rez Terzinch, and Mr. Oaksness as well. <laughs> and Mr. Zeele thanks uh, the interpreters as well. Thanks to you, I would like. <laughs> I would like to share my experience when working with interpreters. Uh, when I visited uh, the UK in the beginning of 90s, uh, I met uh, one uh, uh, expatriate in the UK who said, why are you paying so little to your interpreters who are working so hard? Because at that time we paid about one dollar or one pound for one A4 page uh, written translation. And then I I asked, what are you paying for to you, your interpreters? And they said, well, we are paying actually the same. So by this, I wanted to say that as if we should pay more, but the market is the market. Thank you. And the interpreters would like to thank the listeners as well. Thank you. You have been a wonderful.